So I figured I would use this time. Father asked me to do this, and I just wanted to talk about, you know, uh, Byzantine chant sort of from, the, from your perspective, from the perspective of the congregation instead of from my perspective at the chant stand. And so I wanted to start with talking about what is the purpose of Byzantine chant, why do we use it. Uh, so it's really, I, I, I put it towards four different reasons why we use Byzantine chant and the importance of what Byzantine chant does for us in our worship. Uh, number one would be musical prayer. It's, of course, sung prayer. Uh, we all say our prayers privately. We pray together in church. We pray, and then Byzantine chant is a musical form of that same prayer. It's not distinct or different from any other prayer that you would do in the Orthodox Church. Uh, but further than that, it's also there to create an atmosphere. Uh, everything that we have in the church specifically is to create the atmosphere, whether we talk about the icons, the wood carvings, the architecture itself, father's vestments, everything is to create a prayerful atmosphere and a specific prayerful atmosphere, sort of a Byzantine atmosphere, um, which all of that combined, not just the music, is designed to help foster a spirit of repentance, this feeling of repentance to try and bring ourselves closer to God and to ultimately strive towards theosis. So Byzantine chant is one of many aspects in terms of the aesthetics of the Orthodox Church that help to push us towards repentance and uh, theosis, in other words, union with God. And so that's really what Byzantine chant is a part of. Uh, a great term that I did not invent, but that I use a lot, is called the Byzantine synthesis. And that's really when everything we see and everything we do connects together. Uh, to create this uh, sense of repentance and to help strive towards theosis. So when you have the incense, the priest vestments, the icons, the wood carvings, uh, the architecture itself, all of that united is supposed to create a very specific feeling within us. Um, and I think everybody who's uh, been going to this church knows exactly what we're talking about here. Think of, you know, the, the moment on Pascha when the candle comes out or when we sing Christ is risen for the first time. You need everything in combination for that moment to feel the way it's supposed to feel, and Byzantine chant is a part of that. And so to talk about Byzantine chant itself, there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are some theological reasons as to why Byzantine chant is extraordinarily important and doing it well is important. Um, because ultimately what I just talked about, the Byzantine synthesis, the source of the church's aesthetic forms are not just simply from the surrounding culture of the Eastern Mediterranean, and they're not just there to make it look pretty. There could be a lot of different ways to make a church look pretty. It's a specific type of thing, and uh, we look at all of the aesthetic forms as divine, a way to divine revelation. So we look at it as coming from God. So if we take icons as an example, because it's, it's one that we can visually see and understand very easily, you could look at an icon and say, well, icons come from the Eastern Roman form of early frescoes and mosaics, and then they became Christianized, and that's why they look the way they are, do today. This is true in a certain sense, but also not true from our perspective as Orthodox Christians, because that removes the advocacy of the Holy Spirit from the design and uh, beauty of icons. And this is the same with the music, with Father's vestments, with the wood carvings, with everything. You can't just say, oh, well, it developed out of this. You can from a historical perspective, but that ignores the actual point of what we're doing and also believing in the idea that the Holy Spirit guided these forms for us to be able to use them in the church. Uh, there were a lot of different art forms in the Eastern Mediterranean. The one that specifically got used for icons and developed into uh, iconography, we believe was done for a reason. We don't think it was just happenstance. And so Byzantine chant fits into that. In other words, all of these aesthetics are not vehicles for grace, but are the grace themselves. And this is an idea that comes from the Old Testament. Uh, if we think of the, um, Jacob, the story of Jacob's dream, in which he has a dream of angels going up and down the ladder which inspired the ladder of divine ascent written by John Climacus. And then he wakes up from this dream and he builds an altar based on the altar he saw 
in his dream, which was divine revelation from God. In other words, he saw the heavenly altar uh, as revealed by God and then built a material imitation on earth. And what did it look like? Well, it looked like that. You know, that's the altars that we use in Orthodox churches are based off of these divine revelations given to the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Another example of this is Moses is shown the heavenly tabernacle while he's on Mount Sinai. He descends from Mount Sinai and builds a material imitation of the celestial tabernacle. And what did it look like? Well, it looked like that. And so everything that we do in the Orthodox Church is from divine revelation, not just historical antecedents of a surrounding culture. Um, so this is why we study the early fathers of the church. They were not just simply present when things happened in the church. All of the early fathers were uh, the ones who gave shape to all the forms of our church. They were all interested in music and architecture. They were very well educated men. And Byzantine chant falls into that. Um, another important thing about Byzantine chant is that in the Orthodox Church, our focus of worship is actually not visual, it's auditory. So especially if you've only really come to divine liturgy, you may not have a sense of this because usually in divine liturgy, there's always something happening at the altar. But if you ever come to Vespers, if you ever come to Matins, and if you come during Holy Week, which are Matin services in the evening, uh, there are long stretches of time where nothing is happening up here. You don't see the priest, there's no movement. Uh, if you're watching on a live stream, it may look like the screen froze. You know, it's, it's just nothing is happening. But there's always something happening in terms of the auditory nature of our worship. There's always something being sung, always something being read. And what's being sung or being read is of primary importance in that moment. And so, uh, and if you ever go to either a monastery or a really large church in Greece or in Romania or uh, even in Lebanon, um, and we, we certainly have this in, in the back of our church. There's different things that can be done visually by everyone in the parish. So you may be venerating relics at a reliquary, or you may be venerating the icon in the back, or you may be coming up and venerating an icon of your patron saint, or putting a candle over here in front of either the Panagia or from Jesus. But there's all the thing that um, so you're not looking at the altar, or you're not looking at what's happening uh, up here, but you are listening to everything that's happening. So the auditory nature of Orthodox worship is sort of the uniting factor. You can do a lot of things visually, you can be in different places in the church, but what's happening in terms of the actual musical prayer is what drives the service forward. Um, and this really, I think, stems from the fact that music is a universal phenomenon among the human race. Uh, it's fundamental, it's a characteristically human thing uh, to create music. Every culture has their own forms of music. And this is seen in terms of how scripture was revealed to uh, Moses, the person who dictated the Old Testament, in that the way he understood creation was through sonic activity. God spoke creation into being. So this idea of the power of auditory, of, of what you hear, is extraordinarily important in our theology. Um, so really, uh, what the cantor does is of extraordinarily importance. What we're doing over there, what the choir is singing, is extraordinarily important to making the worship drive forward and to your experience in the congregation as to what we're doing. Uh, and so that's really where I'm going to wrap up here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and then I'll probably do a couple more of these and expound upon these ideas, but that's my introduction to why Byzantine chant matters and why what we do and what we sing is extraordinarily important. Jesus.